Thank you very much, Arturo. And I want to thank Professor Keller, all of the organizers uh, of this conference. You've assembled a, a fairly remarkable agenda uh, and certainly have in store uh, some very intriguing presentations. Uh, we touched on this issue at the Energy Commission uh, in some detail in our 2005 Integrated Energy Policy Report, uh, which has received quite a bit uh, of interest uh, for attempting to begin the process in state government of assessing water needs and electricity needs on an integrated uh, basis. Uh, I think that both subjects have received uh, considerable publicity and public attention over the last several years. Uh, in my earlier tenure in state government, uh, we had an electricity crisis in the 1970s. We also had a drought crisis in the 1970s. Uh, and the two issues were perceived at the time as interlinked. Uh, and there were efforts both on the energy side and the water side to promote an integrated perspective uh, in planning our future needs. Uh, but I have to say with some sadness uh, that over the course of the 1980s and the 1990s and on into this decade, uh, that linkage seems to have been lost. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, when we addressed it in 2005, we were greeted, greeted with a great deal of surprise uh, by various stakeholders that uh, we were putting together questions that, that those particular stakeholders had not previously uh, thought should be uh, connected. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, there has been a great deal of activity. Uh, the State Department of Water Resources, the Metropolitan Water District, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, the Western Governors Association, the Department of Energy uh, have all initiated or continued efforts to promote a closer connection between energy planning uh, and water planning. Uh, at the Energy Commission, we have committed uh, to a multi-year uh, research agenda uh, that will address this as one of our principal priorities. Uh, and I have to say, uh, again, with quite a bit of humility, uh, we have only started to scratch the surface. Uh, the uncertainties involved and the, the knowledge of what we don't know uh, are substantially greater uh, than the limited amount of discovery that we've made to date. Let me start by providing a couple of fairly stark statistics. 19% of the electricity needs in California go to some aspect of the water cycle, be it supply or pumping or treatment or recycling or use or wastewater. 19% of our electricity needs are devoted to the water cycle. And I have to tell you, we face a fair amount of uncertainty in the electricity world. Everybody knows that uh, there is no greater source of uncertainty as to what our future electricity requirements will be going forward than what our water system will require. There are technological developments, supply developments, environmental developments that will have electricity ramifications that we have not yet gotten a particularly good handle on uh, in order to plan for the future. 19% is a pretty large number. What percentage of our natural gas needs do you think are devoted to the water cycle? Would you believe 30%? 30% the natural gas that we consume in California is directed to one aspect or another of the water cycle. Much of it is heating water, we all know that, but natural gas has become our preferred fuel for the generation of electricity. So that 19% of electricity that is devoted to the water cycle, much of that is natural gas fired. Uh, in Southern California, uh, we are about to uh, step up, I think, the, the public uh, debate over uh, 
uh, whether we should develop an increased reliance on liquefied natural gas uh, imported uh, into California from foreign countries, uh, as you follow that debate, recognize 30% of our natural gas needs are water related. Professor Keller asked the question and wanted me to address it, where are we siting power plants in the future? Uh, I have to tell you with as much candor as I can summon, we don't know. We just don't know. That doesn't mean that there aren't sites. Doesn't mean that we haven't found a large number of sites. Doesn't mean that we haven't issued permits for a large number of sites. But our process today for locating electricity generating sites is a laissez-faire path of least resistance, respond to what gets proposed, don't preemptively plan for what should be built system of government. I think that's going to change. I think it's likely to change considerably uh, as we move forward. But today, the most candid answer is we simply don't know. What's likely to change it? I think the state's emphasis on renewable sources of electricity of necessity is going to change the way we plan our electricity system. I think more and more people recognize that the types of renewable sources of electricity we're likely to rely on at a utility scale of generation are very location specific. Geothermal resource in the Imperial Valley, a wind resource around Tehachapi, scattered pockets of both wind and geothermal uh, across the eastern side of the Sierras uh, up into the far north of California. A solar resource in the desert regions of southeastern California. One thing that unites most of these new generation sources is their remote locations and their current difficult accessibility to our transmission grid. That's likely to change another paradigm of our electricity planning process. I think over time we're going to become a transmission centric planning process. Everybody knows that it's difficult to site or grant permits for new electricity power plants. It's substantially more difficult to license new transmission lines. Uh, they are linear facilities, meaning that they cross great amounts uh, of real estate. One thing common uh, about projects that impact real estate, property owners generally have economic motivation to resist uh, infrastructure projects that they don't feel will enhance the value of their real estate. And as a consequence, the transmission siting process in California and elsewhere is one of the most contentious licensing processes that we have uh, in our infrastructure uh, regulation. We're going to need to focus our planning on the transmission system if we're going to harvest those remotely located <laughs> renewable resources. Another factor likely to change the way in which we plan for energy resources uh, is our emphasis, our newfound emphasis in this country on climate change. Last year, Governor Schwarzenegger signed uh, AB 32, which puts in process a planning process designed to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in California by about 25% from where they are today. The design is that by the year 2020, we will be at a CO2 and other greenhouse gas emission level that we last saw in 1990. It's not as aggressive a goal as the European Union uh, has adopted, but it is the most aggressive targets currently set in the United States. And most of the proposals uh, in Congress can probably be calibrated uh, by those attempting to emulate the California uh, reduction levels. If we do that, if we successfully develop 
uh, a plan uh, to achieve that level of reduction, I would predict that we will place much greater emphasis in our electricity system on energy as opposed to capacity. Historically, the primary planning uh, focus of an electricity system has been reliability. Uh, how can you be assured that the system will continue to operate on that peak day in the summertime when air conditioning comes on? That promotes a focus on capacity. How many power plants do you have that will be available on that peak day? And historically, that's been the focus of the electricity industry in the United States, particularly in California and the Southwest and other air conditioning peak driven systems. If we're focused on greenhouse gas emissions, though, not only do we care about that reliability on the peak day, but we also care about the kilowatt hours that are generated on all of those non-peak days as well. And we're likely to start calibrating our system on the emissions that come from that generation 8,760 hours of the year. That's going to complicate our planning process considerably. Wind systems, which generally the existing machines are given a credit for capacity in the low 20 percentiles. The more modern machines uh, may be able to achieve closer to 40 percent but the reality is that most of the wind that we've developed thus far in California generates electricity at night in March and April. It doesn't really generate much electricity on those peak days. A climate change focused paradigm is likely to value those kilowatt hours whenever they come. And if we're striving to achieve a 25% reduction from our current levels, we're likely to place a considerable value on the types of generation that don't have emissions associated with them. Our system will become more complicated from a planning process, will require our utilities to be able to integrate sources of electricity that are intermittent in nature. The job of the grid operator is going to become substantially more complex. How does that relate to water? Well, the types of generation technologies that we're likely to rely upon may not use as much water as our current generation system. Certainly, the wind systems are unlikely to. Most likely, the solar generation is unlikely to. It's not clear at all what the geothermal resource is likely to require in terms of water. It may be a degraded type of water. It may not be fresh water. It most certainly is unlikely to be once through ocean cooling water. Uh, but it's nevertheless likely to be a water resource that may have some alternative use, similar with our biomass generation. These are questions we simply don't know the answers to uh, today. Uh, and they're research topics that need urgent addressing going forward. Let me also say that, that with respect to uh, California's uh, willing embrace of intermittency in the electricity system will come a need for storage as well. Uh, how do we make beneficial use of electricity that is generated at times when we don't otherwise have a need for that electricity. Well, you try to store it. And there are a variety of storage technologies uh, on the cusp of commercial development today. Most of them are one variation or another of battery technology. Uh, and research there <laughs> continues apace, but the results uh, have not been particularly overwhelming for the last several decades. The most proven, the most reliable, and currently, the cheapest form of storing electricity is a fairly inefficient mechanism of pumping water. 
uphill at night, draining it down uh, during the daytime. Uh, we have more than 2,000 megawatts of pump storage capacity in California today. We don't really optimize its usage around a renewable generating profile, but I would predict in the future we will. It's not clear to me at all whether those types of conventional pumped hydro storage systems will be replicated going forward. There's a proposal to do so at Lake Elsinore that is about to receive a federal license, but it's not clear whether that project uh, will prove to be so expensive that no one wants to buy the electricity coming from it. One proposal that, that has gotten a fair amount of interest in Sacramento, and quite novel, uh, and that is whether or not you can take the existing storage in Southern California for treated water. The water tanks that you see in urban areas, uh, generally on hillsides, uh, whether there is spare capacity in those tanks such that adding a reversible pump to the storage facility would create a mini form of pumped hydro storage that could be economically put to work. We've had a consultant estimate that there is a potential 1,000 megawatt of pumped storage facilities available through that particular adaptation of existing treated water storage tanks. Let me give you a general sense as, as to the magnitude of our electricity needs. We do a 10-year projection uh, every two years. Uh, our projections for the year 2016 are that uh, we will need about 67,000 megawatts of electricity capacity. That's up from the mid to high 50s today. It grows at about 1.2, 1.3% per year. These are all weather adjusted numbers. Uh, we make our planning based on average temperatures. The one thing you know about average temperatures, though, is that we never seem to experience them. Uh, and far, far and away, the greatest factor uh, in any given year as to the adequacy of our electricity system is the weather. Uh, last summer, uh, we stressed the entire statewide system and peaked near 60,000 megawatts uh, of capacity. If we need 67,000 megawatts in the year 2016, in our judgment, about 22,000 megawatts of new facilities are necessary. That's about a third of what our need will be should come from something other than our existing generation fleet. Uh, of that 22,000, would identify about 8,000 to meet new growth and 14,000 to replace old plants. Most of our electricity, particularly in Southern California, is provided by plants that were built, brought online before 1970. That's fairly frightening. Uh, from a reliability standpoint, it's not particularly pleasant from an air pollution standpoint. And if you wonder why your electricity bill is so high, think through the fact that our existing regulatory system and the accounting that goes along with it relies on power plants that are about 50 percent less efficient than a modern gas-fired plant. About 50 percent. You ask yourselves, how, how could something that far off current technology be allowed to persist for so long at such a clear and demonstrable cost, both economic and environmental? And I would suggest what you need is a combination of a monopoly supplier a not particularly well-structured competitive market and a regulatory system that tends to pass through problems to the ratepayers. Uh, you've got a formula for our current uh, system of electricity generation. In our view, the utilities should not make 
further reliance uh, on those aging plants after the year 2012. So we've recommended a replacement program uh, between 2009 and 2012 that will replace uh, the full 14,000. Where will it come from? Well, as I think many of you know, uh, the state has been on a very aggressive program to develop renewable source of electricity. Uh, and the climate action team in Sacramento uh, has prioritized where we're likely to achieve our greatest greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, they assign the, the first priority to the tailpipe uh, regulations of automobiles sponsored by Assemblywoman Fran Pavley, uh, now subject to litigation by the auto manufacturers and the federal government, uh, their claim being that uh, California is not allowed to regulate miles per gallon, our claim being that California is explicitly allowed in the Federal Clean Air Act to regulate air pollutants. The Supreme Court will decide this summer whether CO2 is an air pollutant or not. And then I think next year uh, is likely to decide, perhaps the year after, whether California has the ability to regulate CO2 coming from automobiles. The second leading contributor to our greenhouse gas reduction goals will be enhanced reliance on renewable sources of electricity. And of the 22,000 megawatts that I said are needed by the year 2016, we hope to get 11,000 from renewable sources of electricity. That puts us on a very aggressive trajectory. Uh, our statutory requirement is to achieve a 20% penetration level uh, by the year 2010. The regulatory agencies and Governor Schwarzenegger uh, have suggested carrying that trajectory forward to a 33% target in the year 2020. We're about 11% today. Now we need, uh, by 2010, about 6,000 megawatts of, of new renewable capacity. The utilities have signed contracts for about 4,000 megawatts. So at least on a contractual basis, they're likely to hit that target. Not clear whether construction will be timely uh, and whether the 2010 target will be hit in 2010 or 2011 or 2012, but it is our belief, uh, a very firm belief, that we can achieve 33% uh, by 2020, and if we do, by the year 2016, that will have contributed 11,000 megawatts. We expect about 6,000 megawatts from utility efficiency programs uh, on the energy side. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission uh, has uh, directed the utilities in California, the investor-owned utilities, uh, to pursue energy efficiency uh, to the limits of cost effectiveness and technical feasibility. The legislature actually requires that the utilities not procure conventional sources of electricity until they have exhausted all of the cost effective and technically feasible sources of energy efficiency. And we're simply scratching the surface here. Uh, the initial projections are for about 6,000 megawatts. That includes comparable efforts by the municipal utilities. Uh, let me provide some perspective and, and bring this back to a water uh, perspective. In our 2005 report at the Energy Commission, uh, we looked at water efficiency measures as potential sources of electricity savings. And we took the best management practices of the California Urban Water Council. We took eight of them that we could quantify electricity savings for uh, and scaled them up to a statewide application. We determined that scaling up those eight best management practices on the water side could achieve 95% of the electricity savings of the electric utilities already approved efficiency programs 
at 58% of the cost. 58% of the cost. Now, there's no question at all that the electricity efficiency programs that the utilities have been directed to, to conduct are cost effective in the electricity world. Everybody has, has embraced the notion uh, in the electricity sector that the cheapest kilowatt is the one that you don't have to build. Uh, there is not really any dispute other than certain sectors in Washington, D.C. that <laughs> That should be your electricity priority. But who knew? Who knew that we could double current levels of electricity savings potential and reduce the cost if we included the water sector in as well? Now, let me say discovering that was a lot easier than actually implementing it. Uh, and I think those of you associated with, with water agencies uh, know that this has been a long struggle and has a long way to go before we have our efficiency planning and efficiency funding put on an equal basis. Some of the challenge, my friends at the Public Utilities Commission tell me, that it's just hard. To, to calculate who should pay the cost when the water comes from Northern California and is used in Southern California and you've got to figure out which incumbent utility should be credited with how much energy savings and who should pay which proportionate cost and whether that is cost effective to the utility customers who aren't water customers and the Energy Commission, we don't have to, to deal with those accounting questions, so we take the somewhat convenient approach of just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not make too big a deal of it. If you can achieve 95% of the savings of your acclaimed energy efficiency program at 58% of the cost, just do it, and hopefully that will come about. Uh, let me quickly go over a couple of other areas of savings, that are areas of generation that we expect uh, by 2016 that we've not included in our numbers. The state has a uh, target of 5,400 megawatts of cogeneration and distributed generation by the year 2020. Some of that certainly should be available if we promote the appropriate policies by the year 2016. Very difficult in the, the distributed generation area to move beyond rhetoric uh, to actual steel in the ground. Uh, there's a real institutional uh, and market hostility on the part of the utilities uh, to self-generation or co-generation. Uh, and the state uh, needs to figure out a way in which to, to break that logjam. Uh, in the 1980s, we did break it uh, because we were desperate for new sources of electricity. Uh, we had exhausted ourselves uh, in a counterproductive debate over nuclear power and coal plants uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s and found ourselves in a situation where we simply needed more electricity than utility plans had proven financially feasible uh, to produce. Uh, and as a consequence, we put a very aggressive approach to federal requirements that said the utility should buy electricity from its customers and pay their avoided cost, or the utility's avoided cost for that electricity. Almost overnight, we had more than 6,000 megawatts uh, of new capacity in the state. That number climbed to about 9,500 megawatts by the early 1990s, but people got the numbers a little bit off. We entered into fairly inflexible contracts, uh, and when natural gas prices came down in the late 1980s, what had been thought to be avoided costs locked into these contracts with co-generators 
looked awfully high compared to what you could get on the spot market for electricity. And that disparity, in many ways, motivated uh, the large electricity customers mm -hmm. to want to deregulate. They want to find somebody other than utility to buy their electricity from. Uh, so these problems tend to have long tails on them, and they, they tend to be interconnected. If anybody's been doing the arithmetic, which I don't encourage you to do at home, you've noticed that I've greatly exceeded 22,000 megawatts. Uh, I haven't talked to you at all about building and appliance standards, uh, which are likely to contribute significantly more uh, in terms of uh, offsetting savings. The reason I haven't said anything about that is we don't know between now and 2016 exactly which technologies will be allowed as a state uh, to regulate uh, from an efficiency standard standpoint. In 1975, the United States Congress, seeing what was happening uh, in 1974 in California, uh, when the Warren Alquist Act was passed, and the Energy Commission was created, and one of the primary duties of the Energy Commission was to adopt efficiency standards for new buildings and appliances. The appliance manufacturers went nuts uh, and told the Congress, if you allow this to happen, we will face a market that looks like a patchwork quilt. We won't know what type of air conditioner to sell in the United States because each and every state will have its own efficiency requirement. You, the federal government, should adopt uh, preemptive efficiency standards so that these states aren't encouraged to do so. Well, California got out in front of that process and we had adopted uh, standards for most of the major appliances, refrigerators and air conditioners and heaters in particular. Water heaters came later before the federal government could preempt us. 34 standards were included in the 1975 legislation for the federal government with a clear intent that states would be preempted. General Accounting Office uh, published a report last month and found that the federal government has missed each of its deadlines for each of those 34 standards. Uh, the, the misses have ranged from six months to 15 years. And that's for the 11 standards they've adopted for 23 of the topic areas. They've simply blown us off. No standard has been adopted. Now, if no standard is adopted, California has the ability to move forward and adopt a standard before a federal one. And we're, we're weighing that now uh, at the direction of the legislature. We adopted a standard for clothes washers two years ago. Major potential water savings. Again, the, the pattern is pretty familiar. You do that at the state level, the manufacturers go nuts. They go to Washington and say, you got to do something, stop these guys. Uh, we followed the process, petitioned DOE for a waiver, said you haven't adopted a federal standard, let us move forward with our state standard. DOE recently denied that and we're in the process of, of initiating litigation over that. We have a pattern of, of litigation with the federal government uh, in the energy sector that I suspect will probably continue. <laughs> what are the water implications? Well, for something like clothes washers, it's pretty clear. It gets a little more attenuated when you get into the area that, that has received so much publicity this year, the electric light bulb. Should we adopt a standard in California which effectively outlaws incandescent light bulbs? You know that the process for generating uh, illumination from a technological standpoint, it's not really much different than when Thomas Edison rubbed two sticks together. <laughs> the incandescent light bulb puts off 96% of its energy value in the form of heat. Heat, not light, heat. Fluorescent light bulbs have been able to improve upon that about 400%. They last 10 times as long. 
Not all of them are as reliable as parts of their, their industry have been able to achieve. Classic candidate for regulation. Uh, the legislature is currently looking at whether to require us to adopt such standards. Uh, the mere mention in the legislature that this was something worth pursuing prompted Australia to say, we're going to do it, we're going to outlaw this, prompted the European Union to take a proposal that they had had on the shelf since last summer uh, to move it to the very head of their agenda for the post-Kyoto climate change uh, set of initiatives. Uh, I should say it also prompted Venezuela and Cuba to make similar commitments, although we don't feature those quite as prominently. Uh, and the state of New Jersey has pledged <laughs> they will do anything that we do. But let me, let me bring that back to the water sector because remember, 19% of our electricity, 19% of our electricity is water related. You reduce electricity consumption, you're able to reduce water consumption. You reduce water consumption, you're able to reduce electricity consumption. The two are interlinked. The theme of the next two days is exploring how better to discover those linkages, how better to move forward on a coordinated basis. It's exciting for me to be here. I thank you very much for inviting me, and I certainly encourage you to, to take some lessons from the next couple of days. We can all benefit from them. Thank you. who claims he can is either a fool or a charlatan. Yet the projections of the demographers are more than exercises in arithmetic. They make it possible for us to see the impl implications of observed rates of growth." Unquote. The, the sophisticated user of a population projection knows that they are neither a firm predict prediction of things to come nor a mere game played with a computer. Rather, they are a useful planning tool to show us where we're going if the assumptions are correct. What I want to do is to begin, begin with um, the method that the Department of Finance uses to do their population projections. Um, and no, we don't use a dartboard. This is the basic population balancing uh, equation. And what it says is the projected population is equal to the beginning population, usually a census, plus births, minus deaths, plus net migration. Net migration can further be broken out into net immigration, or those people who come from a foreign country, and net, net domestic migration, those that come from other states and or other counties at the local level. So the, there's a basic six-step method in doing the population projections. And the first one is to come up with the benchmark or starting population. We use a file that's provided to us by the Census Bureau, which is a modified age, race, and sex file. Uh, what they do, they modify ages for known misreporting. There tends to be lumping at ages around 10. So if your kid's 7, you'll just round it off to 10. Um, they are by single year of age. Um, what we have done is we've made ours in California, even though the Census Bureau doesn't recognize Hispanic as a race, in California we recognize it as a race, so our races are Hispanic exclusive, and um, then we have other races, the other race, that we have a race that is Hispanic. The next thing we do is we remove the special populations, and these are populations that don't age naturally, and quite frankly, that's the group I want to be in. <laughs> but, but in reality, these are people that don't, that, 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 the, the ages are always going to remain stable. In some place like Yolo County, where UC Davis is really significant, college students are always going to be between the ages of 18 and 24. So what we do is, as, the, as they, they get out of college, they move on and they're refilled in by other 18 to 24 year olds. So for college students, prison inmates, and CYA wards, we pull these out of the basic civilian population because we don't want to age them in place. 
Next, we survive the population. This is an annual process. What we do is we apply survival probabilities. Um, in other words, how li likely, if you're age two, are you going to live to be age three? And we do this by single year of age, and our oldest age group is age 100 plus. The next step is to migrate the population. What we do is we have control totals. We divide these down based on our current uh, estimates by white, what the race ethnic distribution of that migration is going to be. And then based on the previous two censuses, we distribute that uh, race ethnic distribution by age and sex. The fifth step is to create new cohorts or babies. And what we do is we take the female population by age and race. We apply fertility rates. You apply a fertility rate to the female population. And what you do is you get births or new cohorts. So the sixth step is to take those special populations that I talked to you about that don't um, age naturally. We forecast those based on the input from the administering um, state or federal agency. We add that to our for forecasted population. So you have special population plus um, the basic civilian population. You add those two together and you get total population. So as you can see, um, the method to do a demographic projection is fairly simple. And now we'll talk about the art of doing a projection. Um, if you remember um, the population balancing equation, there's basically three components, births, deaths, and migration. And mortality rate uh, relates to the deaths part of that equation. And what we do is we develop life, sur life table survival rates, or the likelihood that someone will age. These uh, life table rates are sex, race, and age specific. Um, but we do use the same life tables for all counties in California because um, the numbers are just too small at the local level to come up with individual life tables. The second component is fertility or the birth component. The rates are uh, race and age specific. Obviously, they're only applied to the female population. The beginning rates are county specific. And what we do is, over the projection period, we merge local rates towards what we're calling statewide norms. We have a couple of different ways to do that. We can either um, actually merge to that statewide norm, or we can follow the statewide trend, or there is a third option that we just leave county level um, fertility rates constant. Uh, migration is, of course, the more vo most volatile of the uh, components of population change and also the most controversial. Uh, we try to work in conjunction with local planners to see what they uh, predict for their local areas. Um, independently, we are looking at the state as a whole to see what we think is going to happen on a statewide basis. We have a little bit more information on uh, immigration versus domestic migration. Um, and then what we do is we take the local <coughs> migration input that we get from the local planners and, in, um, and especially in the short run, we force those, that local input to agree with the analysis that we have done on the statewide basis. Uh, population projections can have different purposes. They can demonstrate the path to an ideal population. They may reflect growth patterns given current land use policies. They may reflect the result of uh, choices, or they may even attempt to show the um, local effects of the national economy. And I want to talk about um, the four basic uh, assumptions that underline all Department of Finance population projections. The first is that no major uh, worldwide wars or natural catastrophes will befall the nation. That everyone will have the right to move where their whims or social or economic advantages dictate that um, assumptions will reflect historical trends and levels unless there's a known reason to modify, and that for our purposes, the assumptions justify the end population. So we're, we ask local planners to help us develop the assumptions, and we don't give them any hint about where that may take them ultimately. And so the uh, ultimate population projection is the result of those assumptions. And I should say that for California, the state population projection is the sum of the local uh, population projections. So next, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, accuracy of the population projections. 
Let me just say that in January, uh, in January 15, 1970, a report was issued by the Demographic Research Unit, and that report said that on July 1st, 2000, the population of California would be 33,910,000. So that's the projection that was done by the Department of Finance in 1970. And in fact, the 2000 census counted 33,871 people, 648. So that's a difference of only 38,382 people, or in 30 years, that's one-tenth of one percent difference. So I guess I can just stop with that. <laughs> but the actuality is of it that um, we've done more than one projection in the last 36 years. Uh, so I, I'd like to talk a bit about those and some lessons that can be learned. I mean, overall, the Department of Finance projections are quite accurate. Um, my analysis is actually based on 10 series that we had projected in the, uh, for the year 2000 and compared that to the 2000 census. Um, the first series were produced in, before the 1970 census, um, and they were done in 1966. And with these series, um, they were about two and a half percent different than what the 1970 census actually found. And I guess what I find interesting is that the overall growth rate during the 1970s was five percent, and these projection series were only off by about two and a half percent. Projections that were done in the 1970s and um, compared to the 1980 census are somewhat different than what was done um, in the 1970s. You see, in the 1970s, uh, the 1960s, we generally over-projected. And you can see by the, that by the 1970s, we're over-projecting and under-projecting at about the same uh, rate. But you can also see that the projection errors are much less than the actual go growth rate. The projections that were done in the 1980s for the 1990 census again, are generally low except for those that were done in the 1990s. And this was because, you know, during the 1970s, things really slowed down in California as we lost the aerospace industry. So only those that were done prior to the 1970s were really too high. And then finally, we have the projections that were done during the 1990s and all those historically. And you can see, once again, the projections that were done in the early uh, 60s and in the 90s were high while those done in the 70s and 80s were low. And uh, generally, again, you can see that although they're projection errors, they remain much, much less than what the actual growth rates were for those time periods. Um, the second lesson is that uh, projection errors reflect the underlying methodology and purpose of the population projections. And what I want to show here are um, a number of projections and when they were done and how they really reflect what was going on at that time. Um, this was the projection that was done in 1966. It was, as you recall, one of the high projections. I want you to remember that during this time period, California was just coming off the end of the, the well, they were actually still in the very end of the baby boom and we had been having a lot of post-war uh, migration to California after World War II. So this particular projection assumed just what was going on at that time. And there was a second series that was done in 66, which actually said what we're going to do is we're going to say everything else remains, norm, uh, remains the same as it has been recently, but we're going to cut back on that domestic migration because we don't think that's going to go on forever. Then we had um, some series that were done in the 1970s. And as I told you, this was a time when um, growth in California was really, really slowing down. Um, we were seeing loss for one year. We actually saw domestic out-migration, first year that had ever happened. Um, fertility was really dropping. The baby boom was over. Um, and so you see the projection series start to drop. Then we have the 1980s, which are still somewhat reflective of what was going on in the 1970s. But as we get later in the 80s, we can see that things have started to turn around. Um, while nationally fertility was declining in California, it was going up because we were having lots of immigrants, we were having lots of, um, you know, migrants coming in that had higher fertility, <coughs> migration was starting to pick up again. And then you have those projections that were done in the 1990s 
that reflected the 80s. During the 1980s, not only did fertility go up, but we actually had years when net migration to California was more than 400,000 in one year. So again, you can see the projections jump way back up again, except in, you know, in 1993, we had what I like to call the Department of Finance curse. We did a projection in 1993, and immediately migration fell out in California. We started for the first time ever in California history experiencing losses of migrants to California. There were actually more migrants leaving California for other states than coming to California. That had never happened before. So you can see that the 1998 projection is somewhat less than the 1993 projection. But what I want to show here is, oh, and these are the actual uh, population numbers. But what I want to show here is these are growth rates over time. And you can see how the growth rates almost exactly reflect that final um, group of, of projections we have. And that's because they're reflecting the current trends, what was going on at that time. So you can predict that the projection that we, do, that we did in 2003, although it's not on here, is going to be lower than the 1998 project. I mean, yeah, the 1998 projection. And in fact, it was. And the third lesson from the population projections is that it, the uh, projections are much more accurate at the statewide basis than they are at the county level. Um, these are the errors in the uh, projections uh, done for the various series. And you can see that um, we tended to be low in the early years and higher in the more, more recent years. Um, the actual variations were... Um, in the, the, the oldest series, we underprojected Madera County by 65%, and we overprojected Ventura County by 64%. But I'd like to note that Santa Cruz and Los Angeles and Humboldt counties, the projection errors were less than 1% um, for those having been projected in 1971. Um, and you can see for the most recent projection series, the errors are less than 2%. But what, what we really need to do is annualize these. And then you want to look at the other axis, and you can see that um, when you annualize them, the old projections are really only off by about 1% per year. So it's not nearly uh, as bad as it looks. It's just that there's a long projection series. Um, looking at it in absolute terms, um, again, if you look at just overall, obviously, as we have more estimates to go on, the projection error declines. But when you look at it um, annualized, you'll see that actually the most recent projections were more, less accurate than the projections that were done many years ago. And a big part of this was because the projections were based on population estimates that were in error. And 90% uh, of the error you see in the 1998 projections was because of the estimates they were based on. So these were the average percent errors. Um, and by county in California. And I guess what I want to point out here is two of the areas where you, areas where you see um, large projection errors um, were areas where we actually saw huge expansions of prisons. That was in Del Norte and Lassen counties, the two yellow counties in Northern California. And so that was really something that was uh, beyond what we were, had in our, our, inf our information we had when we did the projections. And if you look at it in absolute terms, um, you see that uh, the low projections were recorded in areas, well, we have low projection areas in large metropolitan areas. That's because they tend to grow at about the same rate. They're pretty easy to project. Um, and we had larger projection areas in fast-growing suburban areas like Riverside, San Bernardino, and Nevada. Um, so, Really what this was all leading up to was to talk about um, populate the most current population projections. Oh, sorry, to summarize, we're accurate. The, uh, they reflect the methodology and counties are more hard to project. So um, what I want to talk about now is the actual projections. Um, and as I said earlier, the 2000 census counted about 33.9 million people in California. The next largest state was Texas, with a population of about 21 million. Texas would need to annex the surrounding states of New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana to even approach the uh, population of California. In fact, California grows more in one year than there are total residents of Wyoming. 
Um, since 2000, California has added 3.6 million residents. This increase has been made up about 1.9 million more births than deaths. 1.5 million people who have moved to Cali from other California from other countries and 196,000 more people who have moved to California than have left for other states. Um, it's like all the people in Oregon moved to California over the last six years or that we added another city of Los Angeles. Um, now let's look towards the future. And I've broken it into two time periods, 2006 to 2030 and 2030 to 2050. Between um, 2006 and 2030, California's population is expected to increase by uh, 10 million people. This represents an increase of 28%. The growth is driven primarily by natural increase, where there are 14 million more births, and they're, off, they're set by 8 million deaths. And again, natural increase is not something that's going to be slow to turn around. People don't turn their, change their fertility um, actions very quickly. So that's a figure that you can pretty much as going to be happening. Um, over the same time period, we're estimating that net migration, which reflects both migration from other countries and other states, will add about 4 million people to the state's total. So there's another way of looking at it. California today plus Michigan equals California in 2030. Now to look at the time period 2030 to 2050, the state adds another 6.7 million people or a 14% increase. Okay, things are slowing down a bit. Um, this is about two thirds of the growth that took, took place between 2006 and 2030. Um, once again, the change is fueled by natural increase, but the proportion has dropped from 57% to 53%. The number of births during this period drops about a million from the previous period, but the number of deaths increases by two million as the population ages. Net migration declines about a third and amounts to less than three million for this 20-year period. So again, another way to look at this is California in 2030 equals California plus Massachusetts equals California in 2050. <coughs> So now let's look at the population by age group. And this is what's called the population pyramid. We have um, males on the blue side and females on the yellow side. And what you have is the age um, running up the middle. And you can see this still looks somewhat like a population pyramid. The baby boomers are quite evident here. They're aged 42 to 60. And you can also see below them the echo effect or their, their children below that. So what does this look like by 2030? <laughs> uh, the, the baby boomers are now aged uh, 66 to 84. The pyramid no longer looks like a pyramid, but looks more like a silo. Um, you can still see the effects of uh, uh, baby boom children who are now in their 30s, I mean now in their 40s. And then finally, by the year 2050, um, once again, it's beginning to look a little bit more like a pyramid, um, and any surviving baby boomers are aged uh, 86 to 104, and the echo effect, the echo effect baby, uh, baby, uh, babies are uh, now in their 60s. So a bit about race ethnicity, California stopped having a race ethnic majority in um, 1998, Today's whites account for 45% of the population, Hispanics 35%, Asians are 12, black are 6, multi-race make up 2%, and there's less than 1% uh, American Indians and Pacific Islanders. By 2030, the race ethnic distribution looks like this. Whites have dropped from 45 to 29, while Hispanics have grown from 35 to 47 and Hispanics began exceeding the number of whites in the state in 2011. And by 2050, um, the majority of the state, of, of the state are Hispanics. Um, they became the majority in 19, uh, I mean 19, in 2038. Um, and uh, whites are now no longer the majority, well, they haven't been the majority, but now they're a minority. So um, what I want to do next, briefly, is look at population growth around the state. 
Uh, this is again 2006 to 2030. We're going to add 10 million residents. Um, you can see that the slower growth is in the more northern part of California along with the Sierra Nevadas. This is numeric growth, so naturally you see the <coughs> biggest numeric increases in Southern California with a few in the Central Valley and the Bay Area. But when you look at it in percentage terms, you still have slow growth in Northern California, but now you can see, not very well, but that um, many, many of those areas which are fast growing in percentage terms are in the Central Valley. In fact, San Joaquin County increases by 82% over that, that period. Looking at it for 2030 to 2050, um, again, we see the large numeric increases happening um, in the Central Valley in Southern California. Northern California is still slow. Um, what we see is in numeric increases, uh, the majority of those increases, the majority of the counties are um, where the fastest growth are happening is in the Central Valley. Um, and we're actually seeing declining counties like San Francisco, Marin, Humboldt, Siskiyou, Santa Cruz, uh, Modoc, Plumas, Inyo, Trinity, and Alpine. And in percentage terms, again, we see the big increase happening, the biggest increase is happening in the Central Valley. So I guess what you could say in general about the population projections is that the, uh, the population is being squeezed into the center of California. So that was uh, basically what I wanted to cover. We're in the process of doing our new population projections. We did a 2003 series, which I, are, is the latest I'm talking about. We're doing another series right now, which will probably be released by the end of the year. Thank you. Or so. So, so Gary? Page down, that's me from where I am to where I want to be up here. Yes, or just the uh, yeah, arrows if you want. Good morning. We're uh, going to take you on a ride, and I hope you have your seatbelt fastened. It's going to be an interesting one. Uh, this is a model that was designed for use by energy planners, international, national, and state level, and we're going to look at California. We're going to look at California if this thing moves. Spacebar. Okay. I hit the spacebar. Just about right here. Okay. Thank you. The model is a roadmap for future energy sources and consumption. It demonstrates critical need for change and it defines a plan for sustainable energy. This model permits energy policy development to be defined as well as priced. Now you have an, I'll give you an alternative. You can think about this one as an opportunity to invest in natural gas storage, LNG, pipeline infrastructure to meet anticipated demand. Or an alternative to invest in concentrated solar power systems to meet that same demand. Sustainable energy to secure reliable source of supply. It's renewable, accessible locally, and pollution free. This model reduces everything in down to quads. We do this because we want to look for opportunities to swap one energy source out with another. That's the whole thesis of this model. It uses fossil fuels for natural gas, heating, electrical generation, gas diesel fuels, petroleum products, coal, and the non-fossil fuels, nuclear, high, large hydro, renewable energy, biomass, solar, wind, geothermal, and small hydro. The model is a projection out to 2050. It takes into consideration population along the lines of this you've just heard in the and it has also projections that have been developed at the national level
for certain energy sources and then scope down to the California level. You can see what the examples are there. Hydrogen derived from geothermal and wind. Arbitrary decisions based on actual legislation, legislation that was enacted or perceived strategic goals for the state of California, and we have some examples there, natural gas, gasoline. This is the population projection that I use. It's similar to the one you have just seen. I think it just, it defers only out at the about 2035, and as you can see, this population projection has a negative migration going on at that time. Uh, we took in the, for purposes of this model, we took the straight line and took it on out. Now those, Bills and, and position papers and executive orders that were put together by our governor's, our governor, government is listed, exceed Kyoto protocols for the elimination of global warming. That's California Assembly Bill 32. Assembly Bill 1493, reduce greenhouse gases from combustion of fossil fuels, including coal. Eliminate the need for re to refine and consume imported oil. That's an executive order. Another executive order, create a hydrogen highway. Reduce consumption of non-renewable resources, such as natural gas, Senate Bill 1078. And reduce the need to run re nuclear reactors, store spent uranium. We've had a question on that and a discussion on that earlier. Okay, hydrogen. This model Im has made a conscious decision that after 2030, hydrogen will be a key fuel for transferring energy from the point of generation to the point of consumption. Work by Dwayne Myers and Directed Technologies and Jane Ogden at UC Davis has given us the following points. A cost of it is a cost-effective method of delivering energy. It, is, it has sufficient technical capacity to meet the needs. Storage offsets intermittent renewable energy. Generation, such as what you see in uh, solar, for example, it is, could be readily used by hybrid vehicles. And they have determined that the cost of that hydrogen infrastructure is less than gasolines. And that the transmission costs over distances of 540 miles is less than electricity. We use the technical capacity concept in this model. Technical capacity is probably best described by biomass. I can use that one because I've come from the California Biomass Collaborative's work. They suggest that 80 million dry tons of, is available to the, annually for biomass to energy conversion. Yet they say only 32 of those million dry tons can actually ever see biomass to energy conversion. So they take these projections and they apply different systems of harvesting and handling of feedstock, social and political constraints, and come up with these numbers. These technical capacities have been developed largely, that you're gonna see in the model, have largely been developed by the California Energy Commission. So, we take the baseline energy consumption for 2005, we add the population growth, we add, we add the state portion of the national goals for energy resources, we add the state goals, and we apply renewables out to their capacity their technical capacity, we run them through the model, and then we cost out the infrastructure. Here's the pattern. 2005, this is what we look like right now. Petroleum products, heating and transportation are large, are large contributors. Natural gas heating, you can see, is also very heavily into it. And at the top, up up there, is natural gas for electrical. Hydro 
is the yellow bar over there, coal right next to it. And then coming across, you see nuclear in the pink bar and renewable energies for transportation and renewable energies for electricity are the blue and off blue colors. Now looking at, that's at 6.7 quads, present consumption. We're moving to 2050 to 11.6 quads. And we're suggesting that at that time we will be using renewables for transportation at the levels you see here. Renewables for electricity. Natural gas heating still remains a, a piece of the pie and petroleum a, a small, much smaller piece. And the remaining energy sources are in that last bar. Now let's look at the, some components of that. Transportation, let's just look at that. 3.9 quads in, tw in 2005. And you can see the, where we're getting it the foreign, the petroleum, and the state petroleum, and biomass has a little sliver in there. You look out to 2005, if you follow the investment strategies of the, the, and, and the lines of the model, solar as converted into hydrogen takes over more than half. Wind, geothermal, coming up this side here. And then you have state petroleum still in there at a fairly large amount in these last two pieces, and then the whiter is biomass. Somebody asked the question of where we get our natural gas, we'll get to that. This is gasoline and diesel fuels, where do we get it? Now the interesting thing about this slide is that the foreign imports, which is one of our objectives, is to reduce that as low as possible, in this case we're saying zero is that around 2015 it peaks. That's a, overall, if you add all those lines up, it's, it's a modest peak. It's only 5% over what we're presently using. But that does mean we need to have more refining capacity pipeline storage to, to accommodate that. Renewables then come in and through hydrogen, uh, in, in hydrogen production, then we start to really knock that down. Let's look at electricity. Electricity starts out in a fairly diverse uh, pattern. Natural gas here at the bottom. U.S. coal, in, uh, the coal two pieces on the side are there are coal coming around. And if you come up, there's hydrogen from uh, uh, hydro and state hydro. The cordovan and the top one up there are hydro. Wind is at the top with the yellow. Biomass is the blue. Nuclear is the uh, gray. And then we st and state nuclear is two pieces. We have in-state and out-of-state nuclear. And then we have U.S. natural gas again. We're back into the natural gas components. Looking forward, solar is taking the bulk of it. And wind is in there pretty heavily. And state hydro is the is the is the um, blue, light blue one at the top. Now this is going from 1.4 quads to 4.1 quads. So there's a tremendous shift going on here into electricity. Not shown today is the heating, natural gas, in this pie chart, pie chart format, and that's because it's flat. We're projecting it relatively flat, going from 2.0 quads to 2.3 quads out at 2050. But there's some interesting pieces to that. This is the sources of natural gas. Someone was interested in whether it was in state or out of state earlier, and this is the pattern at right now you can see in 2005 and what we project it to be. We see a, we're actually using the foreign imports as the, as the lever here or the or the commodity uh, adjustment because we have renewables coming on and the population growing and sometimes the renewables come on slower than the population and sometimes the population is slower than the renewables and so we have this lead and lag issue here uh, going on. But the, the important thing is if you add all these lines up, that peak there is 25% greater than the peak than our current consumption. 
That means we must have pipelines, storage, and infrastructure to accommodate that. And so you have a, 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 a an occurrence here in what's out in 2020 that we must start to plan for now. And unless the, the top line and the bottom line tapers off due to decline in production, that's the way it's going to be. Now, the other thing about that lead and lag aspect, if there's no investment in renewables, that thing just keeps on going up. Renewable energy flows in California are dependent upon development, new technologies, and rate of capital investment. This is the representative slide for biomass. It's typical, as we sh we'll see, for the other uh, renewables. It starts out with small, uh, relatively small contributions going on right now, and mainly into electricity, as you see. As it ramps up to its technical capacity, it starts to diversify, and you start to see biofuels starting to be produced and hydrogen produced on, in, in the out years. So you see this diversification, which is typical of the other wind, solar. They will not, of course, put out biofuels, but they will be putting out hydrogen as they get out into this uh, uh, longer time period. Let's just look at renewable energy contribution to transportation fuel. We currently have biomass coming in fairly strong at 3%, and that is largely out-of-state biomass coming in, ethanol coming in. And we forecasted it's going out to 2010, 2020, and you can see as it, it increases as it goes out. You can see how solar ramps up here once, it st once the technology starts to get in, uh, improved. You can see the wind starts to con contribute. Again, this is all converted into hydrogen in, the, in those latter categories. This is electricity. Again, the renewable penetration in 2005 is already significant from renewables. We're saying 2010, we're going to have this level. And as it grows out, and it's interesting to see here, what happens is, is that you grow out in 2030, and I'm out in that time frame, and as soon as the transportation starts to take hold and the, uh, the hydrogen starts to flow in that direction, it no longer flows into the electricity side. It's going to meet that fossil fuel demand that is we want to bring to zero, that foreign fossil fuel demand. So the model reveals that California can reduce its greenhouse gases from combustion of fossil fuels in the transportation sector. It can eliminate the need to refine and consume imported foreign oil, and it can maintain present generation levels at nu of nuclear. You've heard a little bit about California's goals. There is a, a renewable portfolio standard that the Commissioner Giesman mentioned, and he explained that fairly well for you. I won't repeat it. Uh, you, he said the governor's uh, has increased those targets, and they are shown there. And the model says we can achieve it. There's a good chance, and it gives you some in information here on the state's ability in the second line here, about 0.58 quads uh, in 28, and uh, 1.47 quads is our demand. So we'd be at 39% if we follow the investment strategies in, that, are, that are embedded in this model. Now, there's one caveat here. The, 20% and all these targets that we've been talking about for the investor-owned utilities are not comp directly comparable to what I've shown you here. This is all energy. The renewable portfolio standard and the investor-owned investor technology, investor-owned uh, utilities does not include the rooftop solar, for example, and the on-site gener in generation. Okay, this, this is where you need to cinch up your, your uh, seat belt. <clears throat> the cost of this is 
It's in the trillions. $43 billion per year over the next 45 years. And every year you don't make this investment, the consequences are what you have, what you have seen. 2.6 of the California's current GMP at about $860 per year per person over the next 45 year period. Now that trillion dollar investment is broken into these components. 20 million for biomass. Concentrated solar, 1.5 trillion. Solar, 360. Wind, 62. Geothermal, 10.6. This is how we came to those numbers, and this is sort of the pattern, and I'll show, show, we'll briefly go over each one of them. We took the cost per unit, we ran it against how it would be mapped out on the technical capacity, how we would develop it up to technical capacity, and we found the cost and we found the quads. That was electricity for biomass, this is ethanol for biomass, going up to 17 billion dollars. Now we've talked a little bit about concentrated solar power. This is a parabolic trough and it has mirrors which focus on a line running through there which has water in it or oil in it. This water can be uh, turned to steam and the steam will generate, uh, will be used to ge turn a, tr a, a, a generator. This is one of the mirror technologies that we're looking at now and this is being developed in a number of states in this nation at the time. The cost of this, And again, that's just building it out to the technical capacities that have been determined by a number of science uh, studies, scientific studies. 1.4 trillion. Interesting to note here that if you go this route, at the level that is shown here, this will cover one half of our required energy by 2050. This is PV at two dollars per twenty-five cents per watt. Again, a build out, three hundred fifty-nine million billion. Excuse me. This is wind. Again, building it out to technical capacity. It's cheap, but the technical capacity is down, as you can see. It's not as much as we can get from other sources. This is geothermal. Interesting thing about geothermal, we can reach our technical capacity by 2017. Okay, in addition to the economic hurdles, there are technical hurdles. Concentrated solar power requires large amounts of land. It requires constant maintenance of the mirror systems. The conversion of electricity to hydrogen is no slam dunk. We have to get over some technical problems in electrolysis and in the bio biological area. Management of biomass feedstocks is a problem area. There's large amounts of biomass, but it's way off in the hinterlands. And some of the biomass that's available is generated in the months of August and September off of our food processing plants, huge amounts. that We can't use it all right now because it just swamps out our system. Transmission, as noted earlier by the commissioner, is Distances from point of generation to point of use are, that's a, a significant hurdle. Coming back to the solar system, this is the Nevada plant, 64 megawatts that's going in. You can see it takes up a lot of land. California land mass is 155, 959 square miles. CS, this, this concentrated solar power requires slopes that are less than 1% and it has a space requirement of 5,900 square miles. There are people that have defined where this could be in California and they have largely suggested they'd be down in the southern, around the uh, Salton Sea area uh, and in the northern California up in the Modoc counties and up in that area. They found the space. And again, if you put it in, 5.599 quads is 
a huge step. And again, this is a resource that is unique to California. When you look at the other states, we have this resource. We are blessed with this resource. Other states cannot go this route strategically because they just don't have the radiation that we have. So it's a resource to be mined. More research is certainly required. Sources of energy is a problem that we, we must continue to look for. Nanotechnology is being used in solar studies right now. Enzymes are being used in the biomass area and combined gasifiers, cycle gasifiers are being looked at in, in the uh, biomass side. Efficient use of energy. Our commercial buildings, our houses, we need to size them to meet our needs not our egos. We must design them to just sip the kilowatts and the therms. We will probably need some financial mechanisms to have cost-effective sustainable energy. Carbon cap and trade is currently under discussion. Energy transmission systems there's some work on high temperature superconductivity that looks promising. These are underground lines run with hydrogen as a coolant. Serious reliance on natural gas. We've been talking about that over the near term. We have some critical decisions coming up on LNG, storage underground and pipeline. Strategic strategies to wean ourselves off of foreign oil. You can see it's really difficult to do this. Hydrogen, fuel cells, fuel economies in our car, public transportation. A sustainable energy future is not far away. For the year 2007 to beyond 2050, the goal of living sustainably within a nation, state, or region must take hold. Each needs to perform their analysis using this model commit the resources, set the policy, provide market and capital funds. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.